Hi there, I'm Bill Trackman, General Counsel of Mountain States Legal Foundation. We are very honored today to have our fantastic guest for our So a Neighbor Asked series, former Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. It's gonna take every fiber of my being to call you Betsy today uh, after having served for over three years in the Department of Education, but I'm gonna do my best. Uh, Secretary Betsy. Yeah, <laughs> Betsy is, of course, the 11th Secretary of Education and also a um, tremendous education reform advocate and also a philanthropist. And we're very, very blessed to have her here today to talk about our monthly topic, which is Title IX and some of the ways in which Title IX evolved under her leadership and what the administration in Washington may be eyeing in terms of changes to Title IX. So with that, thank you so much, Betsy, for joining us today. Well, Will, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. Look forward to the conversation. So there's so much in the education world. There's topics like school choice, there's student loan reform, any number of other issues uh, that need reform. Originally, when you became the Secretary of Education, what brought your attention to things around Title IX and the importance of addressing Title IX uh, as Secretary? Well, Will, I, I'm sure many of our listeners today know the previous administration before the Trump administration, the Obama uh, Office for Civil Rights really um, did a disservice to students across the country when they sent out a letter that was then uh, taken as law to essentially do away with due process protections. And uh, the number of students harmed in that process numbered in the several hundred. And so it was very clear when we came into office that this was an issue we were going to have to tackle and that we were going to do it the right way. In other words, to go through the rulemaking process to put a rule in place that would have uh, the force of law and that would provide provide protections for all involved. And, uh, you know, due process was top among them, ensuring that every um, individual had uh, the kinds of protections that uh, the rest of the world enjoy, not the rest of the country enjoys under, um, uh, you know, other legal proceedings. Yeah, and obviously it took us quite a few years because I remember that uh, this became a priority in 2017 and it took us all the way to 2020 to actually do it the right way and issue that rule. So yes. besides due process, what what other topics were you in, interested in, in terms of Title IX, for instance, free speech, um, protections against sexual harassment, what were the sorts of things that you envisioned would be part of your legacy as Secretary of Education? Yes, well, it was really to put, uh, to sort of restate uh, the importance of free speech protections and um, and that, you know, every student in their education environment have an equal opportunity to access uh, their their educational um, you know program in a way that was going to uh, allow them you know a, a, a smooth uh, entree into that and not to be thwarted by um, uh, you know these rules coming from Washington that they that basically took some of those opportunities away and uh, you know so many areas of free speech had been impinged upon based on moves by the obama administration um it was our it was very much in our interest to uh in really restate the uh importance of those as well as um protections around religious liberty and uh basically everything everything under uh, the First Amendment in the Constitution to to uh, ensure students had um, a good experience in their educational years. Take yourself back to the um, early months of your tenure. You gave um, a key a keynote speech, a marquee speech, um, in September of 2017 on the importance of due process and. Uh, making sure that we enshrine regulations against sexual harassment into regulation as opposed to ruling by letter. What do you remember about the build up to that speech, the reaction to that speech, the work ahead, and how you saw yourself playing into um, changing Title IX for the better? Well, I remember it being uh, quite tense uh, in going into that venue to speak. There was There were a lot of 
um, a lot of protesters already anticipating uh, the work that we were going to lay out to be done, um, anticipating it in a negative light as though it was going to take something away from, from them rather than ensure um, a, the protections that they all needed. And, um, and, and it, was, uh, it was really sort of uh, opening the tent on the direction that we intended to take in the rulemaking process. And that was, again, to really, in many ways, restate um, what should have been clear and what should have been, you know, the sort of operating um, posture and had, had because of the, the attacks through the Obama administration um, and, and the agenda driven, uh, you know, rules that they weren't even rules because they didn't go through the, the actual rulemaking process, but the proclamations basically made out of that department, um, which had had thrown so many students lives into, uh, you know, a tailspin, as well as a lot of the institutions and those responsible for um, overseeing these processes and institutions into tailspins. Um, so it, it it was uh it was it was a you know a tense moment, but it, um it was also met with uh you know our whole team's resolve to do the right thing for students and go through this really painstaking long process to put out a rule that did offer the kinds of uh, full protections for everyone involved in these in in these unfortunate situations. I should say two things for our viewers. So Title IX, which we've been talking about so far, is a 1972 statute uh, signed by President Richard Nixon that prohibits federal recipients of funds from engaging in sex discrimination. So that has a number of forms. Obviously, athletics is one of the most uh, prominent forms that the non-discrimination mandate takes. But it also bars sexual, sex-based sexual harassment uh, throughout schools in the country. And so oftentimes, there are due process concerns when someone is accused of sexual harassment, but isn't given the evidence against them or a fair hearing. And of course, whether speech can be harassing is one of those things that uh, every administration um, has to address one way or another. The second thing I'll note for our viewers is that we do have a Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. So we will be taking some questions and answers today uh, uh, with Betsy. And we, um, if you have a question, go ahead and put in that box and we will try to reserve a few minutes at the end for those questions. So let's talk about the actual process. You know, we announced a rule in May of 2020. So toward the tail end of the Trump administration, take yourself back to those moments and what you saw, at least in terms of the media coverage, the work from your staff and, and the folks who supported you uh, in terms of what your priorities were, how they uh, were borne out by the rule, and then what the blowback might have been. Because obviously, anytime you reform protections against sexual harassment, people are going to say, oh, you're undermining something that's important. Well, it was, uh, as you have already alluded to, it was a long and painstaking process. And the team that worked on it, yourself included, um, really did an amazing job of ensuring that we, uh, first of all, we spent a lot of time listening to different um, groups who had a particular interest in a certain aspect of, of the rulemaking. And uh, so lots and lots of listening sessions, roundtables, and a lot of discussion around what should and shouldn't be included. We, you know, we operated from the perspective of not uh, overstepping and overreaching to really follow the rule or the law as had been passed by Congress and take into account uh, the history from 1972 around protections for, uh, increasingly around protections for women being able to access uh, sports in their educational settings. And, uh, and so we, 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 were, we spared no time. Um, it, we took every bit of time necessary to make sure we were doing everything according to the law, according to the rulemaking process and listening to all of those who had a perspective 
um, that needed to be reflected ultimately in the rule that we put forward. Um, when the rule was actually released, it, you know, there, there was so much speculation uh, before it was released on uh, how much, of course, the, the much of the mainstream media um, echoing the you know far left uh, interest groups in thinking, it, alleging that the sky was going to fall because of the you know the final rule that we were going to put forward, and in fact, um, it was it was I think better received in many quarters than what we had even anticipated. And I know personally, I had many um, higher ed leaders who quietly said, thank you for what you did. Thank you for your work. Um, your rule is very thoughtful and it is going to be very helpful for what we need to do on campus. And, um, and yet many of them were very fearful of saying anything publicly uh, because of these loud voices. Um, but the fact remains that uh, it was viewed by those who were thoughtful about it as a very fair and balanced and predictable framework that they could implement at, uh, at their various institutions. I love that word predictable. You know, I, I'd love for you to expound a little bit more on how important it is to have a fair and predictable system. I remember that some groups that were hostile uh, to the administration, like the ACLU, even themselves acknowledged that the Title IX process on campus was infected with issues. Uh, I think there was even a letter from a number of Harvard professors saying that there were deep due process concerns about the way these kangaroo courts were going about their business and how students were suspended or expelled or had their transcripts notated with almost nothing in, in the way of due process, whether that was the evidence against them, the right to a cross-examination, the right to a written uh, finding, the right to an appeal. Uh, for you, what was most important in terms of creating a predictable and reliable process? Well, what was most important to me was that it be fair and that it be predictable and that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm the mom of both boys and girls. And I thought about both, you know, all of my children in a campus situation, how uh, as a parent, I would want uh, to know that laws were being enforced if one of my children were ever involved in one of those situations. And um, and, and I think that was, uh, you know, that was the approach all of us took was uh, what would we want to see um, for our own children and um, and or what would we want to see for ourselves if we're a student in those situations? And how does that actually comport with the law that was originally passed in the intention of Congress? And um, and, I, and I think, again, we we had uh, a very we have a very strong um, framework that has been uh, well received and predictable for those involved, and it has in, it has ensured that um, for for someone who against whom a complaint is uh, lodged, they have they have a process that they know they are able to avail themselves of, which includes uh, making sure they can know what they're being charged, you know what's what what there's uh, is a there have alleged to have done and. Uh, and what is the evidence around that, and um, and and the ability to question the other, you know, the other party? Um, those were all really important pieces that were denied. Um, literally hundreds of young people in the years leading up to the the rule that we put forward. Yeah, so I'd like to transition to the Biden administration now, because obviously, anytime you change something that's established and is successfully survived numerous legal challenges, you undermine that predictability. And that's seemingly what the administration is trying to do right now. Do you remember your initial reaction when you heard that President Biden's number one priority on this was to try to undo all of the great work that occurred under your leadership? Well, I guess I was quite incredulous about that because um, if he if he were actually uh, you know honest about uh, the rule that we had put forward, 
Um, I, I, you know, really challenge him or anyone else to find where it was not, is not fair and is not right for those students involved in uh, these situations. And so it, it was, uh, it was surprising on one hand, but not at all surprising given the um, construct of the staff at the Office for Civil Rights under his administration uh, with a very, very uh, left, uh, you know, rapidly left leaning agenda. Um, and it's not only it's not only limited to uh, all of the due process protections and um, and a re uh, redefinition of what constitutes sexual harassment, um, which, of course, uh, we, we touched on, but didn't dive into deeply. That was one of the, the big pieces of our rule was really taking a definition for uh, sexual harassment um, as, as written about in other cases by the Supreme Court. So nothing new, we were you know, pulling out of thin air, but actually using that as, uh, as a criteria to help define what is and what isn't and help to separate what is you know, should be constituted as a free expression versus um, something that is somehow uh, um, you know able to be litigated. And so this again, this administration, it not surprisingly, is uh, taking the steps the Obama administration took and going multiple steps further to the left. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of the technicalities, the rule that's enshrined right now, federal regulations, says that in order to constitute sexual harassment, the behavior has to be based on sex and severe and pervasive and objectively offensive. And the Biden administration has proposed to eliminate that rigorous standard and just do a loosey-goosey severe or pervasive with relatively no guardrails on what that could mean. So I suppose if anyone says anything offensive uh, anywhere around campus, that might be severe enough to constitute sexual harassment. Let's stay on the topic of speech because there were other protections in our rule that protect speech, like the right to speak out and defend yourself without being charged with retaliation against the person who is accusing you. And of course, Part of our rule is that schools couldn't uh, get out of a Title IX investigation by saying we've suppressed so much speech. Will you give us credit for all the speech that we've suppressed? But the Biden administration has eliminated those protections on free speech. Why would why would anyone eliminate protections on free speech that are obviously grounded in the Constitution? What 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 is your take on that? Well, I, I mean, again, I think it's very indicative of the far left agenda of those who are populating the Office of, for Civil Rights today, and um, and it's it's clearly with the uh, the nod and the imprimatur of the of, of the White House itself. Um, I, I I can't explain it. <laughs> I, can't, uh, I, I can't rationalize it. But um, I you know it, it again. Um, the what we have seen and what we believe will be part of the final rule is just so far further uh, afield from even what the Obama administration was trying to implement. Uh, I, I think it you know it clearly sets up for a lot of uh, a lot of litigation. But um, the the sad part of all of that is that you know young people will suffer as a result. Yeah, and another part of the proposed rule addresses something of a spicy topic about gender identity. Uh, and so we don't know if this will be part of the final rule, but the proposed rule says that all gender identity um, distinctions will uh, constitute sex discrimination, uh, which it doesn't say specifically, but would presumably include athletics. Yeah. And so we've seen situations like the Leah Thomas uh, situation in Pennsylvania, where biological males are competing against females in athletics. What um, what's your take on the importance of uh, women's athletics and how that the rule proposed proposed rule would undermine uh, that important part of women's athletics? Well, I think most people, when we talk about Title IX, that's what immediately comes to mind is how 
uh, it has uh, been a major part of ensuring that women have uh, met far greater opportunities to participate in uh, women's sports at uh, high school and college levels. I mean, when the rule was uh, was passed in 1972, I was a high school student and I, I swam competitively. I remember uh, the rule being passed. Now, fortunately, my, you know, my high school already had a swimming team and that was great. But um, there were other sports that young, you know, young girls wanted to participate in. And over the years, this has uh, this has certainly meant a, a great deal to young women across this country. And to now have a, uh, you know, the ver being on the verge of a rule that would essentially negate to a basically negate women's sports if biological males are allowed to participate at will in women's uh, on women's sports teams i don't know how you can continue to say that there's actually a title 9 rule or law if if that is really truly allowed to happen and proceed and um and we've seen countless examples in recent months of biological males beating women on uh, in individual competitions and playing on teams, the other team members being injured as a result. And, uh, and it, this is just simply not a tenable situation in the long term. And yet, uh, by all indications, this is where the Biden, Biden administration rule is headed. Yeah, hard to believe. And then the other part of the gender identity debate is, of course, back to the issue of free speech. And we've seen pronouns and honorifics. Uh, we've been getting calls from parents who say that their students are being forced to uh, use pronouns with regard to their teachers or honorifics with regard to their teacher. Um, that they're not comfortable with, both for religious reasons and just personal reasons. And so this would also have a, a secondary effect on student speech and I suppose teacher speech as well with respect to transgender students. Uh, do you see the proposed rules undermining speech in that regard also? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've seen many examples of this already. And if the final rule, again, uh, says as we think it will, um, this is these are just downstream implications of that. Um, and then you also have to take into consideration the tremendous cost of implementing uh, this this uh, perspective of the rule, um, building, you know, additional bathrooms and, uh, um, you know, accommodating in ways that um, just is not even on the radar screen for many people today. And down to young ages, um, you know, we've seen some of these uh, suits being filed against uh, as, as young as elementary and middle school age students for not using the preferred pronoun. Um, so again, the implications of um, this proposed rule are just, uh, you know, myriad and um, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's hard to believe we are at this point, um, you know, so many for many years have just said, we, we'll, we'll never, you know, oh, this is ridiculous. We'll never, ever get to that point, but yeah. here we are. It's almost silly, really. Well, let's also talk about the proposed changes to due process and, and the rule, because, it eliminates the right to cross-examine and test the evidence against you. Uh, obviously, one you of the know uh, what evidence has been, uh, you know, what what you've been alleged to do. Right. So, one of the fundamental parts of our constitutional protections are the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment right to due process and to understand the charges against you. Do you see the tension between the proposed rule and the ability? for students to obtain due process and a fair and predictable outcome as, as part of the process? Well, absolutely. If, again, if, uh, if the proposed rule or if the final rule is anywhere close to the proposed rule, um, many of these protections that we were uh, very intent on ensuring were there uh, will be peeled out, taken away, and, and or amended to a point to uh, really deny the kind of equal protection that uh, we were so intent on ensuring. 
So we do have two questions in the hopper. So if you have a question, go ahead and drop it in the Q&A box. We will be getting to at least a few questions before we close out. Um, so the first question is, uh, this, you're welcome to decline to answer this question if you would prefer not to. What is the worst damage that your successor has done? <laughs> um, and what should the top two to three priorities be if President Trump uh, is reelected in November? Well, I think I think this area of uh, opening up and and re uh, you know renegotiating the Title IX rule is one of the chief areas of damage, and um, I think secondarily the whole uh, attempt to wipe out major pieces of the student loan debt portfolio. Um, unconstitutionally has been very damaging for um, Americans in general who are ultimately going to have to pay for uh, what has been what has been happening. Um, you know, and, and just across the board, the continued nod in every respect to the system headed by teachers union bosses and all of the allied organizations, uh, they are essentially running the Department of Education. Um, it is not oriented around doing the right thing for students. And at, at every turn, it is oriented around their interests and their demands, not around the best thing for students. Well, that leads to the next question, which is what, what were some of the scariest things that you realized upon taking the role as secretary that, that maybe you hadn't fully realized before getting into the chair? Um, I don't know about scariest, but concerning, uh, appalling, um, you, you could use a lot of uh, different uh, adjectives. What I think overall, the, the biggest concern um, that I came with and left with is that the Federal Department of Education is not in any, the permanent bureaucracy there is not in any way oriented around doing the right thing and the best thing for students, no matter their age, from the K through 12 years, as well as students in their higher ed years. It is so oriented around uh, adult interests and adult issues and agendas and adult control. And I think that um, at, you know, at the core, it, it infects everything else. And that is, uh, I think, the biggest concern I've had. Another question uh, from one of our audience members is about homeschooling and more broadly school choice. Um, do you want to offer some thoughts on the idea that maybe since the pandemic, we've seen a lot more folks choosing to homeschool or choosing to opt out of their traditional neighborhood school and, and what thoughts you have about that trend? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's an uh, an awesome trend. And I think if there was a silver lining to the pandemic, it was that uh, parents and grandparents across the country had their eyes open to what was really going on in their children's schools. And even in the best of schools where families have chosen to live in, whether it's suburban areas or elsewhere, they had a firsthand look at what was really going on. And whether it was a lack of uh, even trying to meaningfully help students continue their learning at a distance while things were shut down to very objectionable curriculum, staring them in the face in their homes, of, in kitchens and living rooms, or it was uh, prolonged closures of schools. Uh, there were so many different ways that families really awaken to the fact that the system that they thought was probably doing an okay job was actually dismally failing their children. And so we've seen a huge migration to schooling children at home, schooling children at home or in a, in a in cooperative with other families, um, to in states where there are policies supporting education freedom and the money following the child, um, many, many families opting in that direction. And as a result, 
new schools and new types of approaches to learning uh, starting up. And so I'm uh, I'm very optimistic about the next several years as more of these policies get fully implemented and more families uh, say, you know, this schooling our kids at home or with a, a small cadre of other families is really working for our kids. And we're going to, you know, we're going to build on this. I think it's going to attract more families that want the same thing and want the kind of flexibility, um, the kind of uh, opportunity for their children to uh, forge ahead in their studies as quickly as they're able to or take more time where necessary, um, much more personalized and much more focused around the need, needs of each child. So it's, it's, a, it's a good time for education in that res from that respect. And I, uh, I continue to be very optimistic about the next several years as a result. Perfect. Well, the next question is back to the topic of Title IX. Uh, and this questioner says they actually didn't realize that so much was uh, bound up with Title IX in terms of due process and speech and gender identity and all those other things. Do you think that it's hard educating pro-liberty individuals about the importance of Title IX and maybe the importance of reform? Or is that something that you found most people knew at least a little bit about and so it was easy to have a conversant conversation with them? Well, I think I think it's been a, a complex topic. And again, I think when most people hear Title IX, they think about women's sports primarily. And so I think it's become easier to talk about the, the sort of umbrella topic because of the impact uh, that transgender students are having on, uh, on women's sports and you know biological males participating there. It becomes a very clear issue to many people that way. Then when they have they're more curious about well what Title IX really is and means, um, they can they can you know dig into it further and understand that there's a lot more to um, you know this law that was passed with great intentions in 1972 and has in many respects taken on a life of its own under activist administrations that are bent on an agenda to implement policies that are far to the left of the average American person. And um, and I, you know, I do have some level of optimism that the this administration, the Biden administration, is overreaching so far in this regard that we're going to see a, a similar kind of backlash that we have in other areas because of that overreach. I hope I'm not a, a um a, an, op, an overly optimistic optimist, but I, I do think that they have uh, they have really um, you know stretched the the uh, intent of this law in ways that nobody ever anticipated and wouldn't have believed you know 15 years ago. Uh, how do you think we, we've alluded to COVID nineteen and the homeschooling trend? How do you think that COVID nineteen affected? either your tenure in office, the Biden administration, or education more generally. Uh, I remember um, very early on in the pandemic trying to have my kindergartner do remote education, and you couldn't have 30 seconds go by without the teacher saying, hey, Johnny, pay attention, turn your screen on, why, you know, give, show me your whiteboard. Uh, what other trends or um, impacts do you think that COVID-19 may have had on education in the United States. Um, obviously we talked about the choice element, but otherwise do you think that it led to an increase in engagement, involvement, reform movements, anything else that you wanna comment? Well, it definitely led to more families being engaged with and involved in their children's education, whether it's uh, going to school board meetings to you know, demand that schools be reopened or uh, to see the curriculum that was being foisted upon children. Um, but I think it, it, also, um, it also had a tragic effect and impact on millions of students who were locked out of their schools for months longer than they ever should have been. And in, you know, going into the pandemic, our uh, achievement levels in the U.S. 
um, compared to our other peers around the world were already um, just not acceptable, not in the top 10 in any subject area. Well, the pandemic only exacerbated that problem many times. And uh, frankly, it's hard to see how many of these young kids are going to have an opportunity to catch up again and to uh, you know, surpass um, where they were before the pandemic and to really get prepared. And uh, you know, we, we, we hear anecdotally, so many of them are just passed along to the next grade because that's the, you know, it's the time to do that. But kids are graduating high school without an ability to read well, to understand what they're reading, uh, without, you know, the, the fundamental uh, ability to do basic math. And it's, it's just, it's not acceptable. When we're spending on average over $16,000 a year on every child for their K-12 education. That's on average. It's much more in the major urban areas. And most of those urban areas are where the kids were kept out of school for the longest period of time. And then the system was fed another $190 billion during this time, specifically with the goal of having kids make sure they catch up after the, you know, during and after the pandemic. None of that money has been going to anything positive to help these kids uh, regain uh, their footing and to actually get on a right track. Um, so the, the, the system is it, itself is just indefensible. And uh, it's, it's another reason why there, the argument that the, uh, all of the money going through federally for the Department of Education should go back to the states. Ideally, it should go directly to families to spend on behalf of their kids. But um, there is nothing positive that comes out of that building in Washington that is adding value to an average child's education experience. Yeah, part of me was hoping that um, on your way out the door, you would change the locks so that uh, nobody could get back in. <laughs> uh, we do have one reviewer who just uh, commented and reminded me that uh, after, as you were referring to, parents attended school board meetings, exercised their free speech right to talk about their kids' education. They were branded domestic terrorists by the National yeah. School Board Association yeah. and by Merrick Garland. Yeah. yeah, exactly. With ties right back to the White House on that. Yeah. Uh, the next question, I don't know if you have thoughts on this, but someone asked, what will the influence of artificial intelligence and AI and chat GPT generally have on American education. I don't know if you have uh, any thoughts on that. Certainly it's it's sprouted up a lot more since uh, 2021. Uh, so if you've okay. had any thoughts and you wanna share them, please feel free, otherwise we can move on. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's, it's a very, very good question. And I don't think anybody could rightfully say they have an accurate answer. I think it's, uh, it is sort of the wild west in terms of uh, what the implications are and what what the positives and what the negatives are likely to be. I do think, uh, I mean, it's it's clear that uh, AI is going to be a reality for all of us in some fashion. And so rather than uh, trying to block it and bar it, let's, uh, let's embrace it and figure out how it can work best for kids and for, uh, you know, for kids of all ages, um, for lifelong learners. Uh, but, you know, the, the places that are, are denying its impact uh, do so, I think, with uh, the potential for great peril. I think it does have to be a very serious part of discussion in, uh, in, in every uh, community and, and in, 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 you know, within the family itself. Um, but it's it, it's a it's a very good question. I've I've heard and read a lot of different opinions on what the likely impact's going to be. I don't think anybody anyone truly knows. But um, we I, I think we have to we have to acknowledge that we have to figure out a way to navigate with it. Yeah, in one of our other cases, we're suing the uh, FAA over discrimination, race discrimination, and air traffic controller cases. And we put into ChatGPT. Should air traffic controllers be chosen based on race? And of course, ChatGPT gave us a robust answer supporting our uh, our lawsuit against the FAA, which was <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, in our last few minutes, I do want to talk through what you're up to now. I know you're um, 
a very strong proponent of economic literacy, and you've been talking about other education reform issues. What is going on in your life on a day-to-day -day basis right now? Well, I'm continuing to advocate for policies that are going to give families the education freedom, the choices to make the best and right choice for each child. Uh, you know, as you know, there's been multiple states that have passed statewide education savings account programs and others that are expanding existing, whether it's tax credit programs or whatever the particular flavor of the state's education freedom policy is. And that is exciting to see. Um, also advocating with members of Congress around the federal tax credit bill, which would um, help come alongside what the states are doing and give uh, some rocket fuel to those efforts in each state, again, to allow families more freedom. I think, uh, again, we while reflecting back on the question about AI and its impact, I think the more, the more freedom, the greater number of families have to find the right educational fit for each of their children, the more likely we're going to have models that are going to navigate uh, the introduction and the application of AI better than uh, trying to force fit this through a system that has clearly failed so many kids in so many different ways. The more uh, variety we can have in providers for K-12 education, the more creativity that we'll see in how uh, different uh, leaders will approach that. And um, I think that will be very, very healthy for every family and their children and ultimately healthier for our country and each of the states in which uh, we see that happening in a meaningful way. Well, our conversation today has run the gamut from Title IX and speech and due process and uh, all the tremendous work um, that you've done. And then now we're talking about AI. Uh, if if you were to be make the be best case for optimism uh, about the future, having talked to hundreds of people um, around the country who have appreciated the work that we did, but are maybe worried about what's going on in Washington today, what would the best case for optimism at this point in 2024 be in your mind? Um, I would say the reorientation around uh, the child and the best thing for the child, preparing a child for a meaningful future. Um, we aren't going to have uh, uh, a growing, um, robust nation if the rising generation doesn't have opportunity to become prepared themselves. And I'm heartened by the refocus of many around learning about our nation's founding and its founding principles. I think that you know history and civics have been so woefully forgotten in all too many settings for decades now. This was not just uh, the last few years. It's been uh, a process over a long time. I see the reorientation around the importance of learning those things. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, I think that and the, again, the freedom using the funds that are expended on, already expended on a child to find the best kind of educational fit is going to bring about a dynamism in K-12 education that we haven't seen ever. Um, and maybe early on in the uh, in the earliest days of, of the system in the late 1800s. But um, I, I have, I'm, I'm very, very optimistic that the greater the marketplace, um, the better it's gonna be for the rising generation and those to come behind it. Well, obviously parents and teachers and um, reform activists are on the front lines here. What role, if any, do you see for lawyers and litigators? To, uh, <laughs> well, I think there's secure. there's going to be plenty to there's going to be plenty of lit litigation to pursue um, once this administration has uh, continued to play its its hand. Um, as you've seen, there have been so many ways in which they have overstepped uh, the the bounds of the federal agency and the federal government, and um, I, it's it's you know. It's sad that there has to be litigation, but on the other hand, I'm thankful to have uh, 
organizations like yours to really um, thoughtfully pursue these ill-advised and ill-conceived uh, rules and and uh, laws that that well rules that they pretend are laws, mm -hmm. uh, and and to to really go after the things that are antithetical to um, our constitutional rights and 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 you know founding. What a nice note to end it on. Well, we are so honored to have you for this time, Betsy. Again, hard to say, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to. Um, Thank you again. I'm so, so uh, happy for Mountain States to have you as our guest for this month's So a Neighbor Asked webinar series. Please come back and visit us anytime. We'd be honored to have you again and again. What an incredible conversation about Title IX and education and reform and the Department of Education and the government and all the ways that parents and teachers and students uh, are involved in the process. Uh, we uh, will be having a, an April So a Neighbor Asked webinar, so stay tuned. Uh, for information about that. Thank you to all of our supporters and viewers for submitting their questions, some truly great questions today. Uh, and with that, we are adjourned. Thanks, Will. Thank you.